When I prove my holiness among you, I will gather you from all the foreign lands, and I will pour clean water upon you and cleanse you from all your impurities, and I will give you a new spirit, says the Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So these are readings for the third Sunday of Lent, for year B, and we get the great reading of the Ten Commandments to lead things off. And it, it's interesting that this happens against the background of the Exodus. So obviously there was the great Exodus where God takes the Israelites from their captivity in Egypt and moves them out of Egypt, out of slavery, and helps to lead them towards the promised land. And here we receive the Ten Commandments, which a lot of people view as being only negative things in the lives of the Israelites. They're always being prohibited from murder, from adultery, from stealing. But I think it's interesting that this takes place on the background of the great exodus, where God leads his people away from slavery. And in a certain sense, I think the Ten Commandments point to an even larger exodus, a, an exodus in terms of how the Israelites are to live. And what I mean by that is we have all of these statements that God makes and writes upon the tablets that are to be binding upon Israel, that they are to have no gods besides him, that they are to conduct themselves in a certain manner. And in a certain sense, this is the great exodus away from an even greater slavery. The first few commandments have a lot of description with them. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that place of slavery. You shall not have other gods besides me. You shall not carve idols for yourself in the shape of anything in the sky above or on the earth below or in the waters beneath the earth. You shall not bow down. And it goes on and on. And then later on in the reading, the other commandments, you shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. There's really no explanation given to those. And they're given later on in that list. So what does this mean? I believe that when we look at the Ten Commandments, the first ones pertain to how we relate to God, how we are to give God worship in our lives. And the explanation there is given so that we can bind ourselves more closely to God in how we relate to him. And it's from that relationship and that particular way of relating to God that we are actually set free from slavery. Now, what kind of slavery is that? Well, it's the freedom from the slavery to sin and the slavery of our passions. God leads the Israelites out of Egypt in, from physical slavery, where they are physically forced to work for the Egyptians and subjected to mistreatment by them. But he also leads them with these commandments and with this covenant between God and Israel, that they are to be his people and he is to be their God. And in all that, there is a greater exodus, almost, that the people no longer need to be slaves to their emotions, to their passions, to their worldly desires, that God has revealed, this is how I am to be worshipped, and this is how you are to free yourselves, and I will be with you to help you be freed from slavery, the slavery of idols. And we may think, oh yeah, idols, you know, nobody worships statues anymore. That's true. But we still have many problems with idols. We worship particular relationships in our lives. We worship money. We worship career. We worship sports. I mean, things that take the place of God. Things that we place up on that pedestal. It's this that God wants to bring us out of Egypt from to bring us out of that slavery so that we can live in the freedom of God. This is the pathway to the Exodus. And in all of these commandments, they aren't simply prohibitions. They are 
ways of viewing life that maybe are not obvious, but in a certain sense, each of these dims our intellect and takes life from us. God comes in to change all of that. He comes to give us life, and he says that unless you follow these commandments, these are what is going to truly make you happy. It's in this relationship with me that your happiness will be found. And then in the Gospel, we see this remarkable scene, the cleansing of the temple, where Jesus comes in, he drives the money changers away, he upsets their tables, he drives their animals away from the temple, and said, do not make my father's house a marketplace. And then he goes on to say, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Which is an astonishing claim. Because the Jews even respond, this temple has been under construction for 46 years. What do you mean? But he's referring to the temple of his body. Now, what exactly is that all about? The temple is the place where God is rightly praised. And the temple is also the place where God, in his true presence, dwells. It's where God rests, truly. And Jesus identifies himself as the temple the place where God truly dwells, which makes perfect sense. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. And in him, we see the Father clearly. We have access to God by Jesus' humanity and his divinity coming together in one person. And with that, connecting that with the Ten Commandments and the great exodus of the Spirit almost, that we can be led to God through this covenant and through his son Jesus. Later in the gospel, Jesus will say, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There's a darkness in a slavery to the passions. There's a darkness when we're tempted by all sorts of things and swayed by the allures of the world or by our own desires. But this covenant with God, this exodus from the slavery into the light of life, is what Jesus would like for us. And he is love itself. He wills our greatest good, always and exclusively. He is the place where God dwells, truly and substantially. And he is the place where God and humanity meet and can touch one another. He is the path to the Father and the light in the darkness that leads us out of our own personal Egypts and leads us to freedom. Heart of Jesus in whom there dwells the fullness of God, have mercy on us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God love you.